So I thought as we're praying through Paul this week that we would pray by starting using Paul's words that we're going to follow with for the rest of our morning reflection. So um, let me pray using these words. This is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in the knowledge and depth of insight, so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Christ Jesus, to the glory and praise of God. So that's in the start of Philippians 1 this morning, and what a remarkable prayer to walk through today. It's a beautiful and stirring prayer that God, that Paul breathed over God's people in Philippi. And he prays for abounding love, purity and righteousness. But purity is not a word that creeps into our culture and society much these days. It's perhaps not a word that sits in my vocabulary much as a pastor and a worship leader, let alone as a follower of Jesus or a walking temple of his Holy Spirit. Dare I say that in our world, purity is an ideal that is sometimes now scoffed at, treated with derision, and perhaps thrown in the garbage. Why? Well, at its heart, purity comes right up against our self-satisfying, self-actualizing ideals. And it says, there is a way that you can live and breathe that far outstrips any picture of what you think is best and what you want. And it also says, there is a way that you can live that calls for a humanly impossible level, humanly impossible levels of self-control. And self-control is perhaps a dying art in our day and age. Bishop Curry said this, self-centeredness is a cancer that can destroy us all and that left unchecked will destroy the planet. And purity also calls forth not just um, self-control, but sacrificial love, so much so that it is far beyond any notions of self-improvement. It requires divine love, a love that, as Paul prayed, abounds, that leaps, that overflows. So that Paul is praying that we might know this love more and more, more depth of love, more depth of insight, more, more, more. And if Paul is praying this, then we know there must be more to discover, more to know, more to understand, more to grow in when it comes to knowing the love of God. So the first question I want to ask us all this morning, and we chatted about this as a staff team last Wednesday, is when it comes to receiving from God, when it comes to receiving God's love, what kind of receptacle are we? Are you like a sieve? Are you like a gutter? Are you like a sponge? Are you like a bowl? Are you like a flat pane? Are you like a pool? Are you like a little teaspoon? Do you have the same affection of Christ dwelling in you that, that Paul said he did earlier on in this chapter in Philippians 1? Or have you run dry? To put it another way, the one who has settled for less than love, the one who has made God's love into mere facts and philosophies, the one who thinks they have graduated from love or outgrown it, the one who thinks love's promises are temporary or empty, the one who thinks they can outrun love, the one who thinks they don't qualify for it, the one who can put a limit on God's love or put a cap on what they can receive. They will not grow in purity. They will not see righteousness outworked in their, eye, in their lives. Nicky Gumbel said this, a bad attitude is like a flat tire. You can't go anywhere unless you change it. A bad attitude is like a flat tire. You can't go anywhere unless you change it. Only in God's outpouring of love and in our receiving of it, not in human striving, can we grow in purity. To take love out of your pursuit of purity is like taking the essential cog out of a clock. Everything stops ticking and the weight of it all collapses and falls to pieces. A life without God's abounding love is a life heading through impurity and self-destruction. So what kind of receptacle are we? Notice the order of things here, abound in your love that you may. Our purity only comes because love has been given and it can be received. We can't get pure first to earn God's love. That's simply not possible. 
And I know I've said this before in St. Swithin's on a Sunday morning, but it's not as if our lives are an exam and God is the exam adjudicator, strolling around the rows, distantly observing, ensuring that we play by the rules, constantly wanting to catch us out. God is not an exam moderator dragging the passing grade down so that our lives can make the cut. He is not the quality assurance part of a factory line, tweaking us just to ensure that brand quality and saleability are maintained. Jesus gives up his life so that we can fully live, fully live in a way that pleases God. It's a gift of grace that our lives can be pure and can be pleasing to him. And in verse 10, we see that purity is only discerned through the lens of love. Without love, all we're likely to see is the speck in another's eye. Without God's love, we can't face the prospect of extracting a plank from our own eye. It's too painful. And a person far from embracing the love of God will become blind to their own impurity as a coping mechanism. It's too hard to deal with on our own. And that becomes denial. And it might harden your heart. So what kind of receptacle are you? I'm not the perfect receptacle. And when it comes to purity, I know I mess up. I know I do. My housemate knows I do. My girlfriend knows I do. My family knows I do. My colleagues in this room know I do. And probably you know that I'm not perfectly pure. I'm sorry when you've been on the receiving end of my imperfections. And if we really start to pull apart our definition of purity, we realise that there are a bit big lives, parts of our lives that can be left unpure and overlooked. Initially, when I thought about the word purity, I thought about the addictions and the idols, the perceived big hitters of sin in our world, whether that's, um, you know, a, a kind of striving for money, for sexual lust, for power, addictions to drugs, what we do with our mouths in terms of swearing and, and slander, racism, greed, even, you know, things that are unjust in our world that are far from pure, like slavery and human trafficking. But do I also consider the little list of white lies, the fleeting moments of selfishness, the judgmental spirit, the jealousy or the comparisons, the self-promotions, the gluttony, the things I watch on Netflix, my carbon footprint, my stubbornness, my argumentativeness, <coughs> the things that no one ever sees, the things that never leave my mouth or end up in my hands, but are in my head and in my heart. Are all these things pure? It was once said, if you desire a moral society, you can't simply legislate it. Thank goodness that we don't get purity off our own backs alone. Are we open to God's refining fire to deal with the dross in our world, even the unseen stuff? In verse 10, we also see that purity is discerned humbly only on the day of Christ, when we see his pure, unsaturated, radiated righteousness, will we know the full extent of purity. Paul, an incredibly intelligent and articulate man, revered amongst theology, literacy, philosophy and law scholars, even to this day, he is not 100% fully able to describe purity. That's not to say that we're scrambling in the dark. In Paul's letters to the church alone, we can glean so much about how to live our lives purely. And this is not the perfect man. He claims to be the chief of sinners, and yet he's here praying for the purity of his fellow believers. He's not casting judgment. He's not claiming to have it all worked out. In this moment, he's praying. And even when teaching the church on purity elsewhere, you can hear Paul's earnest prayerfulness. He just wants what's best for God's people. And he's humbly offering what purity looks like in the light of Christ. Lead us not into temptation is in one of our most prized of prayers. And it assumes that temptation can come to any one of us all. No one is impervious. Impurity is a trap worth interceding for, for your fellow brothers and sisters. So can we commit to pray for the purity of one another? Lead us not. Lead us not. And here's one final thought as I end, and, and this I also need to hear. 
In verse 11, we see that purity is not simply the absence of garbage, but the presence of fruit. You may have heard the phrase, the devil gives work to idle hands, but that doesn't mean we need to be constantly busying ourselves in order to avoid temptation. On the contrary, true rest, is, as John pointed out to us in these morning sessions last week, is one of the purest things. Pure, true rest is one of the purest things. Because in holy rest, we should find our hands laid open to God himself and to his abounding love and not simply scrambling around for the latest human antidote. So what kind of receptacle are we? Can we put down the garbage and pick up the fruit? And can we commit to pray for the purity of our fellow believers? Let's pray. This is my prayer that your love may abound more and more in the knowledge and depth of insight so that ye may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Amen.